Good afternoon, good morning, depending upon where you're joining us from. I'd like to welcome you to the Appsian Security Webinar today on Modernizing Segregation of Duties in SAP. Some of the things that we're going to be discussing today is exploring the challenges of today's segregation of duties model in SAP. We're also going to learn how a policy-based preventative, preventative control can be used to mitigate SOD violations. We'll review how continuous monitoring can simplify SOD reporting and audits. We're also going to see how a hybrid approach using attribute-based access controls can strengthen your SOD and further reduce business risks. So quick introductions. Um, so my name is Greg Went. I'm the Executive Director of the Security Solutions here at Appsian. I've been with the Appsian team coming up on exactly seven years as we speak almost. So before that, I worked in oil and gas retail and higher ed, and I've always been you know, pretty much within the ERP space my entire um, career. Uh, Rajesh, why don't you do a quick brief introduction of yourself? Sure, Greg, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rajesh Rangaratnam. Uh, I've been with uh, SAP product development for the last decade, and before that, it's been application development and um, SAP ERP for 20 plus years. Uh, have been part of uh, design and development of multiple um, marketplace solutions, solution extensions for SAP, and I'm very glad to be sharing the solution with you all today. Perfect. And Rajesh will be back later later in the session today to actually do a demo, and so you guys can see this in real time in one of our systems. Um, just a little quick house notes before we do get started. We are on GoToWebinar, so there's a control panel typically on the right-hand side of your screen. Everybody is muted for today's session. Uh, if you do have any questions, please use the GoToWebinar control panel to go ahead and submit those questions during the session today, and we'll make sure those get answered. Also, if you have any additional questions, um, you can always email us at info at So let's go ahead and get started. Started. So when we talk about, you know, why we are here talking, just a brief introduction of who we are at Appsian Security. Now, what we do is we protect the SAP data and transactions. Um, we do it through multiple ways. I'm not going to go in through a ton of detail of how we do that yet, um, but we utilize our Appsian Security platform to provide both protection and analytics within um, multiple um, solutions. Obviously, today we're going to be talking about our SAP um, certified solution, but we also have solutions within the Oracle platforms as well. So as a company, we were founded in 2012. We do have over 250 customers worldwide. And as I just said, we have ERP security solutions for SAP, Oracle EBS, and PeopleSoft. So jumping in from you know thinking about how um, the how you're really accessing the system um, and, and what you're doing. If you think about the traditional security models and how this has always been done, it's always been um, we're gonna we're gonna secure you from the from the outside in. And what we're changing here with this is really a paradigm shift. We're gonna start at the foundation. We're gonna start at that data and the transactional level. So it allows you to completely change your thought process on how you're going to secure your applications and how you want to protect them. What we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to add context aware controls that account for data user and access attributes. So it's going to take all of those things in and we also have a granular real-time visibility into the activity because we have um, very detailed information that we're gonna capture as to what these users are doing, which really provide you with actionable insights. And from my experience with our implementations, once you have those insights, it's gonna drastically change how you um, control your system. So it's going to change how you allow that access to take place, which is really the ultimate goal because it's going to make you more secure and it's going to help in your compliance. So as you can see, it's all about drilling down into that layer of protecting the data and then moving back up. So when we think about something else that's that's truly really exciting for us as an organization, um, it is something that is relatively very fresh off of the press, as you can actually see. This was just announced about a week ago. Um, we did acquire a, a, a GRC software leader in Expandian. There's going to be a lot coming on this. Uh, we're really excited about the joining of the two teams. 
And it's going to be um, a wonderful solution for our customers out there in, in the marketplace. So it, it's merging of great technologies on both sides. Um, and we're really, really excited to be, be able to announce this, this acquisition. So um, look forward to more on that. You can also, also do a little bit of Googling and find out a little bit on, on your own on that. So let's go ahead. Um, what's really wrong with the current approach to, to SOD? If, if we think about some of the, the common challenges, you know, if we could actually raise hands and we were all sitting in the room like we used to do with, with conferences and things and not always being on the internet, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have run into these issues before. So um, a lot of times when you think about violations specifically to SOD and, and really whether it's sensitive data, I mean, when you talk about over provisioning and, and privilege creep, that is a huge challenge within these systems um, because somebody's going to move between different roles, different jobs within an organization, and things are always going to change. And it's shocking how many times that I will do a security review and that particular, you know, bullet point right there at the top is a challenge. Um, all of a sudden, you know, if, if an audit occurs, we have, you know, it could be tens to hundreds of people that have way more um, control and access than they ever should have had in the current role that they have as an employee. And it was basically left over. So it kind of trickled through, um, which is why that creep comes in. So when you talk about SOD violations specifically from that, that's, that's a problem. Um, it's a challenge and it's something that is typically mitigated manually. We also have SOD style exceptions with creating overhead and complicating audits. I'm going to go more into that as, as we kind of drill through. So I'm not going to go into too much of that, but um, a lot of organizations deal with um, manual controls, you know, and looking at reports and, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, um, trying to guess right is basically what, what we're getting at there. And, you know, business owners complaining of audit reviews or manual mitigating controls, um, it's because they don't necessarily add value and they take a lot of resources to do. So, I mean, it, it, from that particular perspective, we're not talking about manual controls being a win-win. It's a loss-loss. You're losing man hours, you're losing time, and you're losing productivity, and you're probably losing money from the SOD violations that you didn't catch in the first place. So, um, Auditors, you know, are, are missing the data that they actually need to prove compliance is another is another challenge. Um, and, it, and it's difficult to audit and control these different systems and, and really have uh, the information that you need from an auditor to be able to do your job completely to, to have that insight. So that's one of, you know, that's a common challenge, you know, regardless of SOD or not. Um, auditors are really have a have a challenging job when you're looking at what people are doing, what they're updating, what they're accessing, should they be able to do that, all of those types of things throughout your system. And SOD just makes it even more complicated. And there's an extensive effort investigating and correlating SOD audit logs. And that's normally because it is that manual process. So it takes a lot of time. You know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, when we talk about it, it's not a win-win. Um, those manual controls, the people that are allocated to it, um, they waste a lot of times, waste a lot of time dealing with false positives because they have to search through everything and look at all of the different audit logs because it may or may not actually be an SOD style violation. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, even if you think about it from security events in general, false positives, you know, uh, we had somebody talking a couple of months ago on a, on a, uh, on a webinar and he used the, the term of like static and tuning it in and tuning it out. You know, how do you tune out the static? Well, those are the false positives. How do you listen in to exactly what the, the events are that are important? Forget about the immaterial ones, let them drop off. You know, that's a problem that you're not going to have anymore, but you know, we need to, we need to be able to dial in and listen for exactly the right scenarios of what we're looking for. And that really kind of blends into control and visibility. Because if we think about the controls that we're putting in place, is the control effective? Does it actually accomplish what we think it's doing? Are we reviewing the control? Is it efficient? How much does that control cost in the long run? You know, and we're look, you look at it from the total cost of, of what that control is. If it's a manual control, is it going to find 100% of everything that's out there? You know, things are going to slide through. Does it slow down the process as a whole? So, you know, uh, 
really that effectiveness and efficiency of the controls are very big questions. And is it up to date? Does the control even match what your policies and procedures are today? You know, from that particular, or, you know, from an organizational flow, how many organizations are now doing business completely different post COVID uh, for the last 12 to, to 14 months than they were before? Before everything was probably on prem, you had to have access on prem, you had to do all these different things. Now people are accessing from home business transactions and entering data that we never really thought would probably happen for most organizations. So are your controls up to date with how your business is operating today versus what it was 12 months ago? So that's why we have to think about those controls and how do we understand or how do we tweak the controls? We do that through visibility. So can you identify the violations? Can you see what's going on? How do you prioritize the re remediation of those particular violations? Which ones are the ones that you start with? You know, that's where having all of those false positives and all that extra static in there um, really makes it very complicated. You know, and can you easily prove the compliance when you have to sort through? You know, the auditor is probably going to give you some sort of a red flag on a, on a report because it's difficult to actually see and understand and drill in and say, yes, I am 100% positive that this never occurred. So that's why visibility is so important because it, one, it's gonna help you validate the controls. It's gonna help you be more effective. So, you know, that's why, you know, from a product selection, we actually talk about the two of those um, back and forth. Because if you're relying on static role-based access controls for SOD, there are definitely some challenges with that. You know, in theory, and, and this is, you know, from, from the theoretical perspective, and we often know theory doesn't always match perception or reality, a, a person should hold no more than one role within a set of permissions at a time. And in reality, privilege creep happens like we talked about. SOD exceptions are granted. Sometimes it's totally the rule that it's always going to be granted. And admin accounts get, get exploited where people are able to do, access information that they shouldn't be able to or maybe see things that they shouldn't be able to or update transactions that they shouldn't be able to. So, you know, that's what happens in reality. Um, theory is that everybody should be locked down, that they're only able to do the finite you know, transaction that they were supposed to be able to do in the first place. So when we think about, you know, some of our audits, you know, it's interesting because you kind of think about Battleship, you know, as you're playing Battleship as a kid, what are you really doing? You're guessing, you're throwing a dart at a board basically that you can't see, you know, and, and you're trying to hit these different ships that are of different size. And if you think about that from a scope perspective with SOD style violations, there's going to be all sorts of different ranges. Some of them are going to be very large. Some of them are going to be really, sc really small. You know, can you have the ability to see all of them? You know, when we think about the, the aircraft carrier, it's really large. It's easy to see. It's a lot easier to find because it's something that's going to be completely out of scope. You know, so but when then you turn it around the other direction and you're trying to hit the submarine, which is really tiny, uh, you know, you may have a lot of submarines that are cruising on through SOD and you're only spotting one or two, you know, aircraft carriers or battleships, for example. So those manual processes carry unscalable overhead. The, the transaction fo focused logs are missing context. So it's difficult to drill in to that. And if you're dealing with point in time snapshots, they quickly become outdated, um, which really causes um, a limited sample scope. And, and it makes it difficult to see and address all of the problem comprehensively. And that's really what we're going after here is having a comprehensive solution for SOD. And how do you do that? You do that through intelligent controls and fine grain visibility. We've been talking about it a little bit, but our Appsian um, security platform for SAP really gives us the ability to have both. It blends field level transactions and protections and access controls that are all dynamic. They're context aware, so it's different. It understands maybe where the user is coming from, but also it understands the context of the data. What is this user actually working with? So it applies knowledge to both sides of the transactional um, flow. And then on the back end, we've got real-time user behavior visibility that's going to allow us to see in. So it completes that whole life cycle of, you know, having controls, having that visibility, and then being able to strengthen those controls through the maturity of understanding and having that real-time visibility. 
which really is going to strengthen the security policies and it's going to align them to your business objectives. You know, it, it makes it very easy to do that. We're also going to uncover hidden business risks and, and access violations. And we'll go into how we do that in a little bit more. But we can also streamline and simplify compliance processes like SOD. And we're going to gain agility in, inside of our SAP security controls. You know, to enable that um, intelligent policy based controls, you know, why do we want to do this or how are we going to be able to do this? You know, we want to do it so we can identify and prevent. Those are the main reasons you're going to put in access controls. You know, you want to prevent things from happening, but you also need to report on SOD violations and, you know, at runtime or you can identify it and wait. You know, so that's where we're using that data centric security and real time analytics. Our, our implementation natively integrates with SAP and it can leverage your existing SOD rules. So you don't have to start at the beginning. You can actually leverage a lot of the controls that you have put in place because it enables a policy-based access control. Those policies are all configured within your SAP system and the data-centric security gives you those controls back. It, it gives you the ability to drill down to the data layer. Going back to one of the slides earlier, it's about the data. You know, the user is going to be accessing that data, but should that user work with that specific piece of data or that transaction or the combination of the two? You know, why should they? Do we trust them in a scenario to where we can validate everything to where they do get the transaction and 100% of the data within that particular transaction? Or should they not? You know, so that's where the real time analytics gives you that granular actionable insights to help mature the data centric security that you're going to put into place. When we're talking about resolving the constraints of legacy SOD controls, um, you know, the legacy controls are, are, are a very big challenge. Um, one of the things that you need to do is prior, prioritize SOD policy over role based access controls. It, and, and what I mean by that is it's really enforcing the rules regardless of what the roles or the role based privileges give that person. You know, think about that from what we were talking with controlling access to the data. Um, you know, so when you're controlling access to the data, you have the ability to look at those two things independently. So it allows me to go beyond just roles. And, and that's the reason why. Um, going in at that access with um, context really gives you the ability to protect that data in a much better way. The other side of it is how many people would actually not want to stop an SOD violation in the first place? Who wants to deal with it after the fact? I would actually stop it up front. So then I don't have to deal with it on the back end. I'm not looking at audit reports. I'm not looking through all of these different things to try to find out whether it was a good or a bad, you know, um, or a false positive, for example. I could go through and say, all right, all of these violations are gonna stop. If it meets these criteria, um, this is done. It's not going to happen, you know? So in that scenario, it can really protect you and it allows you to, to go into exceptional um, exception scenarios, you know? So it really um, dials in and one, it's gonna make you more productive as an organization. If you think about those manual controls, stopping it up front uh, saves you a, an immense amount of time. You know, not to mention the time, but it's just the errors that are gonna go into effect as well. Um, because it's gonna become so much easier to uncover those SOD violations in real time because you're eliminating the risk um, that dwell between the time of the audits as well. Um, since you can have that real time insight so when we focus on the policy, um, not the control limitations, you know, so if we think about before, how are you currently enforcing SOD? What are you doing? You know, it's only really um, enforced as strongly as the permi um, permissions and the, and the provisioning is maintained for that particular organization and for that particular user who's working with the data. How often are you validating those? How often are you working with them? Um, after this type of solution, SOD is in, enforced everywhere. And it's only circumvented with with exceptions that are expressly granted. So you've turned the whole model completely around. Rather than trying to capture it after the fact, you can stop it before. So the after model is completely different. It's very proactive. You're no longer in a reactive basis, um, which is going to make you more effective as an organization. So how does this work? How do we do this within the SAP system? 
So when we, what we do is, is we move, excuse me, we move beyond roles and privileges. And what we do is we get into policy-based access controls. And there's some terminology out there that some people are familiar with and others aren't, but it's an attribute-based access control. Um, very different than role-based access control. But what we do is we pair attribute-based access controls with the business rules. So if we think about attributes, what could some of them be? Kind of touched on some of them up until now, but the user, the role, the organization, what are they doing? What are they working with? Is it a specific T code? Is it a specific data element? Remember, we can drill all the way down to that data. Or is it a data classification? Is it private data? Is it financial data? What time of day is it? How many times have they done this? Maybe it's where, you know, now that we have people working from home, are they at home? Are they on the internet? Are they on the VPN? Are they at the desk? Are they in a remote location? Should they have access to all of this and then each one of those or how they're accessing the system? You know, what, what GUI are they using to actually update the information with? So, and we pair that with those business rules, segregation of duty rules, business process controls, compliance requirements, you know, all the corporate policies that are coming into effect, you know, and there's a couple examples down there and I've kind of touched on a few of them, but you know, no PII level two outside of the corporate network. Okay, we can handle that through masking. We can take care of that, you know, certain transactions shouldn't be performed after business hours. I don't know if I want, you know, expenses approved at 3 a.m. or, you know, somebody paying a vendor at 3 a.m., for example, um, you know, or no expenses over X amount or discounts over a certain percentage, for example. So you can go in and actually, you know, really implement not only segregation of duty rules and policies, but also business process policies through this as well. So where we fit from, from Within the SAP environment, you can see that the foundation layer, um, you know, of SAP is the role-based access controls there, and where we actually sit is the data-centric security. Um, so we're going to sit between the data resource, and it's a policy-based access controls. You're going to see SAP GRC on the side. We can leverage and completely work with the GRC model. You don't have to have GRC. I'm just letting you know that we can actually work with or without. GRC. Um, so we are plugged completely into the uh, to the architecture of SAP, which makes it allows us to work within real time of data access within the system. So how do we drill in a little bit more specifically to uh, making SOD controls intelligent? Because when you think about role-based access, what, what's really gonna be able to happen there is, let's kind of walk through a scenario, is user A cannot create a, a PO and release the PO. So the user has a role and then you've got the transactional level. But if we uh, allow and bring in the policy-based access control, what you can limit that to, because you have the context of the user, you have the context of the data, you understand, we understand what they're working with now. So user A cannot create a PO and release a PO on the same order. So we're looking at that attribute layer. That's where we get down to the data. So it allows you to be very adaptive. So we can understand, you know, if if this particular user created created a specific PO or did something, uh, and then what they should be able to do with that. So, you know, that's where we're leveraging the existing SAP access control. So you don't have to change your roles. You don't have to do anything with that. What we're doing is bringing in another layer of adaptive controls um, to layer on top of that to really make it dynamic, policy based, and data centric. To give you a little bit more detail, uh, you know, from a granular perspective, it really enables the technical control that can decipher the the actual violation from that false positive. So if we think about this from, you know, what we were talking about earlier, we could have a lot of false positives just within this exact scenario. So if we think about it, the, the user is going to have a role and they're going to have permissions to be able to create or release POs. What we're able to do is take it all the way down to a document number. So in this scenario, if user two created document one, two, three, they can't release that. But if user two created document four, five, six, um, they could release um, the, you know, user one can actually go ahead and release that particular um, document because we're able to dial in specifically understanding the data and be able to see um, who's 
updating it, who created it, and should they be able to work with this particular data, which is really, um, one, we're gonna have real-time reporting on this and have the ability for um, you to have that insight, which is really, you know, one of the things that we're talking about here is having the ability to understand what is happening is really gonna change the visibility of what you have into your application. Uh, the way I like to talk about it is, is our visibility is really, really spread at numerous different people within the organization. It could be a GRC auditor, it could be a, a security administrator, it could be a business decision maker, because a business decision maker is gonna wanna see this data as well. They're gonna wanna know which one of my employees are actually creating SOD violations. Are they doing it repetitively? You know, do I need to come in for a training? Do I need to retrain this person? Do I need to fire this person? Is this person doing something outside of our normal policies and procedures? You know, having the visibility is going to help you see that. Um, it's automatic, you know, automatically you're gonna filter out the false positives. So now it allows you to focus on what's important. Um, so it allows you to assess risk and prioritize the remediation. You know, because I'm looking at what's important. I'm not having to sift through um, so many false positives. I'm actually looking at real-time events that are happening. So, you know, going back to the battleship, how would you like to play battleship as a kid? I'm sure your your sibling would be really frustrated if every time you guessed a number in a combination, you you hit one of his battleships. You know, that's what we're talking about. Is we can always show you the battleship, so there's no guessing. Um, and that, those continuous insights are going to, you know, streamline many processes. It's going to start with audit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen and I'm going to bring in Rajesh to uh, demo this in real time so you guys can actually see this. Thanks, Greg. Let me share my screen here. So I'm sharing my screen here. Yeah, please let me know if you can see it. We can. All right. So here I have uh, two users that I'm logged in as in the SAP system. Uh, the user on my left side is a business user, SD user one. The user can go in and make changes to the access control policy. And so it's more like an admin user for the Appsian platform. And the second user is the user on whom we are going to enforce the access control policies. And as Greg was mentioning, we are a second layer of filter between the user and the data. So we let the first layer, which is the role-based access control kick in and let SAP authorize the user into the transaction. And then we add in the second layer to add more fine grain access control to the data that the user is trying to access. So to simplify uh, the scenarios, what we have done is from a role point of view, we have assigned, sorry, we have assigned the same role to the users. And so when I go into the user one and take a look at the profile, you can see that the user has SAP on. And so the user can go in and do any transaction or execute any transaction within the system. And similarly, when you look at the profile of the second user, this user also has SAP off. So they are set up in the same way from a role point of view. And so all access control that we are going to enforce are through the Axiom security policy. So from an SOD point of view, we know that when we define the rule sets within GRC for two conflicting sets of transactions that the user should not have access to, uh, we are able to use that to provision access. And in cases where some of the composite roles allow those users to have um, access to these transactions and where we want to preventively stop users from executing the second transaction that would lead to a conflict, we can do that through the Axiom security platform. So here, 
um, for example, if I go in and take a look at uh, appeal, for example, that this user has created. Let's go in and go to the table and pick a PO that's created by this user. And so if I go into the table, you can see that there are a couple of POs here that are created by this user. So now if I try to pick one of these POs and try to post, say, a goods receipt or try to release that PO, that would conflict with uh, the SOD rules. So now what we are trying to do is uh, I'm going to use the PO number 12 and try and go into a PO release transaction and see if I can release this PO. So now when I release this PO, you can see that there is a message here that says release effective. But when I try to save it, there's a pop-up and you can see there is an action security message that stops this user because of SOD violation. So even though the user has SAP all, because of the policy, we are able to check those two conflicting sets of transactions and we're able to stop the user. And as Greg mentioned, we don't have to have GRC. We can define those two conflicting sets of transactions within the action security platform. And we can use that during transaction runtime and we can stop the user from proceeding with the second transaction. And um, just from a solution point of view, we are an ABAP add-on. So we are installed on the app server. And so um, we are agnostic to the UI that the user uses. So it can be Sakui or Fury apps or WebGen Pros. Um, in all those different circumstances, we can still intercept those transactions or the business processes that the user so trying to execute. And we can check the SOD rule sets that are defined either within the Axiom security platform or uh, being bridged from a GRC system like SAP GRC or expanding root sets, and we can enforce that root set in real time. So the good thing about uh, these root sets is that we go down to a level deeper than just the transaction. In this case, for example, if the user were to release a different PL, for example, let's pick something that's not created by this user. So PO5, so if I go into the header and release this PO, you can see that the release effective message is being displayed. And when I save it, the document actually gets saved. So the release actually happens in cases where the user did not create this document. And as Greg was showing in the PowerPoint, if user one created the PO and user two tries to process it, it goes into effect and allows the user, even if the user too had both PO creation and the PO release transactions. So from a transaction point of view, those are two uh, conflicting transactions uh, constituting an SOD, but when you would go down to the document level, they are actually not SODs because a user uh, is not releasing the same PO that was created by him or her. So that way, we can weed out false positives and focus on the real SOD violations. And if needed, we can also set exceptions to that. And so thereby, we can have a mitigating control in place for the user to release the PO, and we can let the business process continue. And as another example, if I go for the same PO, right? If I go into a goods receipt transaction and try to post a goods receipt, in this case, I'll use this PO 12 that's created by this user. And if I try to post goods receipt, again, you can see that there's a block here and you can see an absent message that blocks the user from proceeding with the transaction because that's a, an SOV violation. So this way, uh, when we define the rule sets in GRC, we are able to bridge that into the action security platform or even defining the rules within the action security platform, we are able to read it during transaction execution and we are able to use the different attributes of the user and the data that the user is trying to access and we can enforce those rules in real time and preventively stop SOBs from happening. And all this is captured in the application logs 
and so we can go in and look at the action um the Appian security logs as well as the standard SAP application logs and also these logs are then enriched by the Appian security platform and then sent out to our reporting dashboard where we can generate different kinds of reports so we can uh, look at who's accessing what and we can um, also look at the uh, violations. We'll go into the dashboard as soon as we are done with the access control part. Uh, so the access control can also be extended to different business processes to limit risk. Uh, so SOD is one of them. Um, if I go into another use case where users have access to download data directly from tables, say for example, they go into SC11 and they display a table, say purchase order header, and try to download this information to a file. So we allow the user to view that in um, the system, but when the user tries to download it, we stop the user from being able to download that information and we can stop that from that information from leaving the system. So data exfiltration can also be prevented. And in case we want the users to be able to download some of the information, but not all, say for example, POs created by the user, um, but not uh, by other users. So if we want the users to be able to do that, we can do that. And similarly, um, if we want to stop users from viewing certain material data, uh, let's say classified material data are not um, supposed to be downloaded, whereas um, normal data uh, belonging to material, uh, and depending on the field that we want to control it based on, in this case, the material type is the field that we are going to use to prevent users from downloading certain data. And as you can see, there are three um, rows here and two different material types. And VERP, as you know, is packaging material, and we don't consider that as classified data. But uh, finished goods are intellectual property, and we don't want people downloading finished goods. So when the user tries to download this, we have a rule that stops the user from downloading sensitive data, or in this case, intellectual property, and the user will only be allowed to download packaging material. So the message lets the user know that certain data will be filtered out, and when the user acknowledges that and tries to save it to a file, let's call it. And when I go to the desktop, I expect only one row to be downloaded. So you can see here that only the material type VERP, which is packaging goods, has been downloaded, and the finished goods have been filtered out. So we can make sure that um, sensitive business data is not leaving the system, and we can stop that from happening. And this can also be extended to other business transactions, um, say, when users try to approve POs. And as Greg was saying, uh, it's not only the release strategy that we take into account, but we also take into account the user attributes, such as uh, who is the user, is the user a uh, power user, is, uh, the, does the user have elevated privileges, or where is the user coming in from? Is it a location that's normal, or is the user coming in from a location that's not so secure? And how is the user coming into the system? Is the user using a VPN? Is the user using um, this app GUI or uh, NWBC? And all those different things can be taken into account. And also, um, like if the user is trying to approve the PO at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, that's something that we want to keep an eye on and see how many the user is trying to release, and we can block that. And in order to do that, we can have different parameters. And in this case, the threshold that we have set is a dollar amount. If the PO is greater than, say, 10,000 US dollars, then we stop the user from releasing the PO. So here, as soon as the user tries to do that, we can stop the user from releasing that PO and stop that violation from happening. And similarly, if the user tries to release POs that are less than $10,000, we have a threshold about which the user will be stopped from releasing it. So when the user releases the first two POs, the user is allowed to release it. But when the user tries to release a third PO, we have a rule and we have set that as the threshold 
um, in this case, three POs, um, and we stop the user from releasing any other additional POs within a specific period of time. So in case the user wants an exception, the user can actually double click this and note down the policy that's restricting the user from going into the transaction and send it over to the help desk to uh, verify it or validate it and then have business process owners to approve it and proceed with the transaction. Or if the user waits uh, till the threshold for uh, the particular time frame is uh, no longer valid, and then can go in and do it the next day according to the business rules. And this can be applied to different business processes and transactions, such as financial transactions, HR transactions. So if we want to block certain changes to, say, sales orders um, that are not created by this user, uh, we can stop that. And similarly, if the, cha um, the change in price or the percentage of change exceeds certain thresholds, we can stop that from uh, happening and stop the violation. And similarly, somebody is trying to download HR data uh, more than a particular number of rows or uh, beyond a certain volume, we can stop that proactively and make sure that uh, sensitive data does not leave the system. So those are like different examples of how we can enforce um, business process controls and SOD controls. And um, one more example that I would like to share is um, a masking example where sensitive data is masked for the users under certain conditions. So in this case, uh, I'm going back to the second user to show the difference. So if I go into this user and try to view HR master data, for example, and go into personal data, you can see that this user actually has um, access to all the information within the transaction. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we go into this other user and try to view the same employee master record, you can see that certain fields within the transaction is masked. So the user cannot access uh, social security number, date of birth, or first name, last name. So in this case, say the first name is also sensitive and we want to add first name to the list of sensitive fields. Um, all we need to go do in the security platform is add that field as a sensitive field. And once you do that, that data also becomes sensitive and the user will not be able to view it. In this case, I am going to add the first name to the list of names or the list of fields in the system. And I'm going to save that. So now what I've done is I've added the first name as one of the sensitive fields. Uh, in this transaction. So when the user goes in and tries to run this transaction again, I would expect the first name also to be masked and so the user will not have access to that information either. And in this case, uh, we can mitigate risk by masking completely the fields that the user should not view or we can also apply masking templates and do partial masking whereby the user sees say the last four digits in case a user needs to do certain other processes like run payroll but does not have to have access to the social security number or date of birth in which case we can let the users have access to those kind of information so that's from um, the actual process control masking and sod point of view i'm just going to jump back into the analytics platform and show how we capture all of these data in the analytics platform for um, the different users to act upon it. And as you can see, we have different dashboards here, and the dashboards are tailored towards business user groups. For example, the business risks are for business process owners, and they come into play when we are talking about um, any business processes, critical business processes that need to be monitored or where thresholds have been defined and we want to monitor and make sure that those thresholds for critical processes have not been ex exceeded by the users. And similarly, compliance risk analytics. This is tailored towards more towards the auditors or uh, the security admins that are interested in compliance monitoring or CISOs. Uh, CISO teams within the company that want to go in and take a look at the compliance risk and we can show different users accessing different data and how uh, we can monitor that info. For example, if I go into the compliance risk, um, you can see that it gives a dashboard 
of uh, um, where the users are coming in from. So you have a geo map, and um, this is still refreshing from my end. Uh, so now you can see that there are some users here coming in from Mexico and some from India, and you know that th there are users in the system in those locations, so it's okay. And suppose you see it in different locations other than where you would expect, then you know something is going on and you can drill down and take a look at those transactions. And similarly, uh, you can define critical transactions within the system and you can monitor those. And also, you can define privileged user uh, based on the profiles or the roles and you can monitor those users and see how those elevated privileges are being used by those users within the system. And when it go down, again, you can see where privileged users are coming in from. And here you can see West Coast, um, Oregon, or close to Washington, I guess. And then here in Mexico again, and then India. So you can see where those users are coming in from. And similarly, count of transactions that are run by the different user types, privileged users, non-privileged users, how many are being allowed or how many are denied. And here is the actual SOB report. So you can see who's executing those two conflicting sets of transaction. And you can see here PAO creation. And you have the document number. And similarly for the goods receipt, you know the corresponding goods receipt number. So when a violation occurs and you want to drill down to see when it happened and who did it and what kind of documents were involved, you don't have to dig through the GRC rule sets and then through the activity log and then do a manual reconciliation to um, see what happened and who was in the system during what time. We can directly capture all these during transactional activity and provide the detail at the document level so that when the reconciliation needs to be done or some uh, audit process needs the kind of data that we are looking for, we can just produce the reports. And these are all out of the box reports. And if we need to add more details or add more uh, monitoring controls and report on those, we can do that. That's the advantage of having the add-on on the app layer. We can define processes where we need monitoring and we can generate those uh, monitoring signals to um, to be captured and we can pull them into the dashboard for actionable insights. So that's the compliance. I'm just going to go quickly through the usage analytics. Um, so here, this one is tailored towards the security admins and the business admins in the system. And here you can see transaction usage, where those users are coming in from, what um, was allowed, what was denied, and again, a visual map. Um, the dashboards are tailored towards the business users and the user admins and the auditors, like I mentioned before. So some of the reports might be a repetition, but uh, only certain user groups have access to the dashboard. So um, it's tailored towards what they are interested in. And here you can see how many transactions are granted, how many are denied. And it's based on transactions and also by users. So if you want to monitor different users, uh, say temporary consultants, you can do that. And similarly, if you want to check what kind of access they have within the system, for example, if somebody went into P820 and viewed sensitive data, we would capture that under full access, and that would show that the user viewed sensitive data. Whereas if the user went into P820 and did not view sensitive information, then we would capture that under limited access, which means that the user had access to the transaction but did not view sensitive data. So we can capture that at um, the user activity level. And also trends across different user groups, if that's of interest, and also from IP ranges. And again, here, privileged user, non-privileged user activity, and also by transactions. And if we need to monitor certain elevated profiles, we can do that. And in this case, we are doing, uh, we are capturing activity performed by SAP All, and we can capture document IDs, what kind of activity was done, in some cases, tables, fields, and also um, values that were changed in the system. And uh, in case we need to monitor abnormal activities, such as users being on the system for more than a um, more than eight hours or whatever maybe the time frame, we can do that as well. And if we see users on the system 
outside of their normal work hours and performing any critical business activity, we can monitor and report on those as well and stop them if needed. So that's an example of the user activity. And I think business risk is the last one that I wanted to share. Business risk analytics, again, captures um, business process risk and um, how they are, how the different transactions are being executed in the different process areas. So we have um, segregation by business processes, HR, SEM, and access status for those different business processes. And also, again, where users are coming in from. And here we capture any changes in master data. Uh, if master data is being changed frequently within the system, uh, in this case, vendor changes, vendor creation, or material master changes or creation. We want to capture that and see if it's happening frequently and if the same user is changing um, master data frequently, we want to know why and tweak access based on that. And similarly, if somebody is changing prices or discounts for vendors or customers, we want to know why. And we can go in and see uh, the transactions used, how many times did they try to change it, and take actionable um, or um, take action based on those insights. And similarly, if somebody's changing financial information, such as payment term overrides for business partner, which could affect the bottom line of the company, we can monitor those, stop those if needed, and also see how many times a certain user is doing um, the uh, change for certain vendors and capture that. And similarly, if somebody's running bad jobs for transactions that they don't have access to, um, we can monitor that and we can report on that as well. So that's from the analytics point of view. I know we are close to the top of the hour, so I'll stop the demo here and hand it over back to Greg. Perfect. Thanks, Rujesh. So real quickly, just a couple of additional slides. Just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please use the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side to uh, go ahead and submit those questions while I'm covering off on just the last couple of few slides. So um, first off, as you can see, when Rajesh went through the demo, this is native to your ERP. It's extremely important from a design, implementation, and performance um, solution because it allows you to have a rapid implementation and obviously a negligible performance impact that's actually part of our certification with SAP. It has to meet those performance requirements, but it's also going to streamline the maintenance and updates. So going a little bit further, this really is one component to a larger platform. We have specifically been talking about SOD style controls today. Obviously, there's additional things that we can do. Rajesh kind of touched off on a few of them during, during, the, uh, during the demo, but Obviously, if you want to see the entire platform and what we're able to bring to the table today, um, you can definitely set up um, a specific session for just your organization. So then you can do a deep dive, ask whatever questions you want to do um, of how we can help secure and protect your SAP system. So wrapping up, you know, SOD really doesn't have to be a pain. As you saw today, you can change the whole model that you've got going. Um, you can make it a, a proactive model rather than a reactive model, which is going to make you far more efficient in the long run because it's going to allow you to capture and know what the SOD violations are up front. So, uh, you know, we can help you by extending your SOD controls to mitigate violations and really stream, streamline, streamline that reporting. Um, it's going to strengthen the preventative controls because we can dial in uh, mitigating the violations from, from privilege screen. Uh, creep. Oh, I can't speak all of a sudden. Um, but we can also simplify the exception scenarios because we can get at that data layer and understand what element that particular employee is working with. It allows us to really dial in um, the controls so that when it comes down to um, working through those exceptions or trying to see how many violations have actually re occurred in real time, um, you can dial those in specifically. Um, because of having that data level access. Um, and it really allows you to modernize your detective controls. 
you know, so you can uncover 100% of the violations. And that's really the goal. I mean, you want to be able to uncover 100%. You want to be able to protect your system. You don't want to have any of those losses. And you want to do it in an automated manual versus a manual um, time consuming process. So that's ultimately the goal, um, which is ultimately going to give you additional um, you know, benefits from that, like simplifying um, compliance. You, you know, it's going to be much easier when they're actually looking at, you know, no false positives. They're not going to have all the static. You know, they're going to be able to sit there and play Battleship and actually win repeatedly over and over. Um, and that's really the goal, you know, of what we want to do here at AppScene is give you the return on your investment, protect your SAP systems, protect your transactions um, through multiple different ways through our security platform. And what we talked about with SOD today was just, just the tip of the iceberg of what we can do. So um, with that, I'm going to check to see if there's any questions or um, I may bring in Ryan. Uh, Ryan, any questions out there? Hi, Greg. Yeah, I have a few questions here. We'll knock off. Um, let's see here. Uh, in terms of uh, the reporting, uh, is there any way to send automated reports, uh, say, to control owners to sign off on exemptions? Uh, sorry, Ryan, can you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the, the reporting, the dashboards there, uh, is there a way to send uh, automated periodic reports uh, to control owners so they can sign off on exemptions or review data? Yes, we can. So um, both are uh, native dashboards for reporting as well as uh, Splunk uh, can trigger emails and reports to uh, the uh, stakeholders and we can make sure that uh, it's set up in the frequency that's required by the business process owners and we can trigger that. Great, okay. And the other one here uh, is What's the typical approach uh, for configuration uh, for users with SOD exceptions? How are those policies created? Uh, so the Accent Security Platform allows us to define SOD rules, uh, and that will be enforced across the user base. But if we have certain users that need to be accepted from the SOD violations, we have a process of adding those exception users to a user group and we can define policies around those exceptions. And in those cases, only the users within that user group that are accepted from the SOD conflict will be able to run those two conflicting transactions. So uh, the platform provides a way to um, add exceptions to the normal rules. Great. All right, and we get one more here. Uh, does this solution support cross-application SOD? Uh, yes. So uh, one of the things that we can do is we can bridge um, data from different business applications, such as um, ERP, SRM, CRM, to the analytics dashboard, which is one dashboard, gives you one view of the different applications uh, within the landscape, and you can bridge those to a single dashboard for a consolidated view and you can check cross SOD violations that are happening within the system and you can um, react to it. Great, thank you, that, that sums up all the questions there. Thank you, Rajesh, thank you, Greg. All right, perfect. Thanks, Ryan. I'd just like to thank Rajesh for, for being on the webinar with me today, and I'd like to thank you for, for joining today. I hope that you found this hour both useful and informative. Uh, we hope to help you solve your security needs in the future. We also have some upcoming webinars. Our next one's going to be May 26th on breaking down the authorization silo. So um, you can definitely go out to the website, sign up for that there. Um, Really looking forward to it. Um, also looking forward to um, what we're going to be able to do with since we brought Expandian on board as well. So um, with that, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Appreciate you guys being on the webinar with us today. And we will see you on the next one on the 26th. Thanks a lot.